Hello and welcome to the Brain Software Podcast coming at you from Toronto, Canada. This is not an official numbered episode. This is another in-betweener episode and we are thrilled to bring you a fun discussion with a special guest. And he lives in California. Like us, he's a trained hypnotist and he's a self-confessed colossal failure at many things. But he admits it. So it's okay. And in fact, it's more than okay because he's also ridiculously successful. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring you keynote speaker, entrepreneur, author, the creator of the Dilbert comic strip, and hypnotist, Scott, Scott Adams. Adams. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, let's let's begin. We started off by Mike and I both bought a copy of your new book, Reframe Your Brain. This is your latest book of not your first book by by I many means. Yeah. And we both loved it. So we want to talk about hypnosis, persuasion, reframing, brain software, all kinds of awesome stuff. Right. And especially because um, as an NLP trainer too, reframing is nothing new to me, but I thought you had brought such a different spin to it and you've made it immensely practical. I absolutely devoured the book and we're recommending it to just about everybody we know. So you hit it out of the park there. Well, thanks. You know, your, uh, your viewers might not know I'm a trained hypnotist as well. So I'm sure we'll be talking about that. But it's not really a surprise that other hypnotists kind of quickly, you know, get what I'm doing right away. 100%. So, good. That means I, I hit the target. Yeah, let's, maybe we should start there. We're sure. very curious. When did you study hypnosis? What got you interested in hypnosis? And eventually, I imagine that maybe before or after, personal development became part of the path as well. So what got you interested as a child or as an adult, hypnosis and personal development? So I grew up in a small town, and our, the one doctor we had in town was also a hypnotist. And he hypnotized my mother when she was giving birth to my younger sister. And she reported to us, and I don't know if this is true, this is just what my mother said at the time, that without any drugs, she gave birth with no pain. So she was awake and aware, and mm. you know she saw the whole process, but didn't feel pain. Now... I'm not 100% sure she was reporting correctly, but it was so impressive that I thought, well, I've got to learn what this superpower is. So in my 20s, I was living in San Francisco, and I thought, no matter what else I do, this, this feels like a good skill to put on top of it, you know, if you can understand how persuasion and brains are wired. And so I signed up for uh, the Clementus School of Hypnosis. It doesn't exist anymore. It was just a small class. There were maybe eight or ten of us in the class, probably eight, and one instructor. And we would just meet a few times a week until we could hypnotize each other. And did you do anything with it after that? Or did you just sort of go, okay, cool skill, put it on the shelf for a while, and then eventually realize, oh, this has all kinds of applications to other areas right. of life? Uh, not only did I use it right away, I use it for everything and all the time. Oh, nice. <laughs> Now, now that's something that's something you'll you'll recognize right away. You it's it's sort of like it's a knowledge as much as a skill. So everywhere you go, the knowledge goes with you, and every every new situation, you can apply that knowledge almost universally. There's almost no place it doesn't apply. So I use yeah. it in my writing, my my art, my mm -hmm. negotiating, my live streaming, just everything. Uh, let let me give you an example of using it in art. Um, one of the uh, concepts in hypnosis that I like is that you don't want to be too specific when you're giving somebody an induction. For example, and again, this is not for you. This is for the, the audience if they're not familiar. So instead of saying you're, imagine you're walking through a forest and uh, there's a tree to your left. It's an oak tree. Yeah. Now that would be a mistake because as soon as you said there was a tree, they saw whatever tree that was most compatible with their mind so you should let them see their tree you mm -hmm. don't want to over specify so if you look at the dilbert comic it is very unusual in several ways dilbert doesn't have a last name his boss his boss doesn't have any name at all there's no first name that's true he's, he's, the, mo he's the single most common character even more care i think more common than dilbert because he's always interacting he doesn't have a first or last name you don't know the name of the company 
that he works at. You don't know the town he lives in, the car he drives. You don't know his political party. It's, it's just all unknowns. In fact, you don't even see his eyeballs or his mouth when Dilbert talks. He doesn't have either one. So it, it creates the maximum um, situation for people to read into it their own situation. If I said Dilbert is a chemical engineer and he works for a company called DuPont, mm. well, you might say, well, you know, I've got something in common with that, but he's not me. But, but the most common thing I hear from the comic from the very beginning was, do you have a camera in my office? It feels like you're in my office. You know, Dilbert is me. And they would also pick other characters and say, I'm, I'm Alice or I'm whatever. So you, you, wanna, you don't want to over-specify a you know, very just basic thing you learn in hypnosis yeah. that you wouldn't, think would, you wouldn't think it would be that important in the external world. But it's, it was a, probably one important. of the most, most keys to my success for Dilbert. Crucially important. That, that's really interesting because we, we are 100% on side with that. The imposition of our own model of the world on other people is almost always bound to fail. I mean, we had Milton Erickson with his amazing work with metaphor where he could tell a killer metaphor and have the person transform, which as we say, is great if you have the unconscious mind of Milton Erickson, but most of us don't. But now the modern therapy appears to be leaning towards the elicitation of the client's model of the world and working within that instead of just coming at them with a hammer and trying to knock it into our, our own system. Yeah. I, re I really like too, Scott, that the the vagueness by leaving out specificity that doesn't need to be there. Like you said, it allows the the reader of the comic strip to imagine their own details, which makes it a heck of a lot easier for them to be in rapport with the idea and go. Hence the result. Oh, you do have a camera in my office, and it makes me think also of cold reading statements. We did a podcast sure. a while yeah, back yeah. on cold reading, where you're you're just saying stuff to people that if they don't know any better, they just think you're reading their mind because they can fill in those blanks. And that's totally hypnotic. And of course, they're only going to recall mm -hmm. the, the hits. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to remember the misses. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, 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 I've done some cold reads with friends where, um, for the audience, again, you pretend you're a psychic and you just make, take some good guesses. Yeah. And I, I think it's worked, you know, maybe one in three times I tried it. It was just like, oh, my God, I, yeah. how did you know that my grandmother's name was Mary? How yeah. do you know that? It's like, well, you, you just say you stuff know. again. And and you've been having some technical difficulties recently, haven't you? Oh, no, wait, that was me before this podcast. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the one I like to use is I, I can see your, it could be a grandmother or a grand, grandfather. I see the grandfather. He liked to work with his hands. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't? Yeah. Or what's the scar on your left? Oh, yeah. Here? That's right. Yeah. One I used to use on stage. I did all, pretty close to 5,000 stage shows, which is how I started in hypnosis professionally and i was doing mentalism as well and when we get some young woman up on stage towards the end i'd be doing a blindfold routine or something would say oh and by the way how did you get that scar on your left knee and they oh how can you possibly yeah, almost women are aware where the scars are guys don't really care about them and if they have the tiniest thing you know it's he nailed it he said you have a scar on your left knee and when they'd respond that it was accurate i'd say and that's really interesting underwear too and of course <laughs> brings the house down right <laughs> A period X-ray eye. Oh, I love it. Let's let's talk about let's talk about reframes because obviously yeah. that's the the entire content of your book. And I think you made some. First of all, I started reading the book on my Kindle before I got the physical copy, and I read your intro about the dog walking. And actually, I'd like to have you tell the reframe of the dog walking because. I started howling in laughter. I think I was sending you messages going, oh, we're going to get along so well. Like <laughs> This was so funny to me. And I I love it. I'd like to have you tell the audience that reframe, and then we can start talking about reframes in general. So so this reframe was sort of the, the friendly one that everybody can get, and it's got a dog in it. So, you know, gets you, gets you into the, the mode. And the idea was that my dog, Snickers, uh, would always want to take a walk, I thought, because I thought I was exercising her, so she's not sitting in the house. And I would take her out, and she'd be wanting to sniff and pee on everything. And I'd be like, I'd drag her. You know, she had a little harness on, so it's not around the neck. And I'd be like, ah, come on. And, you know, I don't know if you know, but the little dogs are harder to manage. I think I think, I think, think the big ones, if they were hard to manage, they killed them. So, that, so the big ones that were hard to manage didn't have babies that, that grow. But the little ones, they were just like, ah, chihuahua, bite my leg, it doesn't matter. So you get all these unruly little dogs. So I've got a little dog. 
And uh, she will not walk. She just wants to sniff. So one day I'm, li- I'm just flipping through Instagram. And there's some you know, self-described dog expert who says, people don't realize that they need the sniffing more than they need the walking. Because uh, the sniffing just lights up their brain. You know, we can't understand how much a sniff could do. And I thought, am I really denying my dog her greatest pleasure by not letting her linger over the urine of other dogs? <laughs> Is that <clears throat> am I am I am I a terrible dog owner because I won't let her sniff urine? I want to walk in the sunshine and stuff. I'm like, oh, I'm a terrible person. So I so I reframed it. So instead of taking her for a walk, I take her for a sniff. In fact, I'm thinking of changing your name from Snickers to Sniffers because it's all she wants to do. And, and then you just observe the change. Oh, my God, she's so happy when she can just go sniff what she wants and she comes back exhausted without, without the walking. I mean, there's walking as well, but, you know, the sniffing exhausts her. And then I thought, well, this is good for her, but now I'm bored. Like, <laughs> just standing there. So I remembered uh, seeing something from uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman about breathing technique, where you do tw- two quick inhales followed by an exhale. The only reason I don't normally do it is there's no key or trigger in my normal day to say, okay, here's the time you just stop and do your breathing, because I'm always on the go. But I'm standing there with my dog, and I'm thinking, well, this is exactly the time to do the breathing. And then I can trigger it so I always have a key because I walk the dog every day. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to be breathing, why don't I work in my posture? Because you know how you get a little slumpy if you're not thinking about it. So I thought, all right, chest down, shoulders down, breathe well. And and by the time I get back, I've walked in the sun in the morning, which is also a, a good health, mental health thing. I've done my breathing, I've done my posture, which also makes you feel a little better, and I've pleased my dog. And all of that was just because I thought of it differently, a yeah. reframe. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And the reason, one of the reasons, Scott, the book engaged me so much was a reframe literally changed my life because I was doing all these stage shows. And when oh, I started yeah. in 75, there was nobody else in Canada doing it. And um, so I pretty well had the market to myself. Then other people started coming along and many of them just mimicking my act. And of course, the um, a lot of them started to undercut each other and undercut me. So their prices were plummeting, plummeting. And I kept saying, saying to my wife, I'm a stage hypnotist. Like I've, I've got to be at the best. And I had limited myself severely. And I wound up reading Marilyn Beausavant's book on brain building. And one day I woke up and I went, good grief. I chunked up instead of staying at stage hypnotist. So what's that an example of? I realized I'm a communicator and everything changed. All of a sudden, my whole world opened up and I wound up becoming a police trainer and a forensic hypnotist and a wine writer mm-hmm. and an opera critic. And it just, because these were all at a writer and these all became aspects of communication and stacking the talents like you talk about. And so this absolutely resonated with me from the most simple reframe imaginable. I'm a communicator and everything was transformed at that moment. Yeah, yeah that that's a huge one. I can totally get that. But, and you also learned that your hypnosis background makes you a better writer. Yeah, it definitely does. Because we come, we become very adroit at changing people's states and bringing in the emotion. And yeah, mm-hmm. quite certainly that, that's the case. Yeah. yeah. When I write, I feel like I have, I don't know if it's synesthesia or, or, or not, but I can feel words. Mm-hmm. That's synesthesia. For I have sure. synesthesia yeah. too. Mine's a different one. Um, I see music. I've seen it my entire life. And I didn't know till I was about 12 that other people didn't. And J.S. Uh-huh. Bach, I used to love because I'd look at a fugue and I see it in front of me. In fact, it got so powerful, if I'm not careful. If I listen to Rachmaninoff, I can't listen to his third piano concerto when I'm driving because the picture, they, the patterns get in the way of, of the road. I mean, I, I literally can't listen. And I remember saying as a kid to a friend of mine, oh, this looks really good, the way the music. He said, what do you mean looks? And I went, uh-oh. And I can't turn it off. I can sort of mute it or put it in the background. But uh, so it sounds to me like you have synesthesia happening there, too. I have a solution for you, Mike. Kill myself? Tesla autopilot. Then you can listen to the music all you like. Tesla boy here. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) To tell you, that's going to change everything. When you're not going to drive somewhere, you're going to ride somewhere. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so Uh, cool. I I, I don't want to be whoever has to clean the back of the uh, 
the self-driving taxis, but oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of which you, you have some really nice material in there about the idea of what's possible versus impossible. You referenced Elon Musk actually in the book quite a few times, which I thought was cool. Cause I'm a huge fan of Elon Musk and Tesla shareholder and driver of their vehicles many for He's many got years his now fourth one on order but yeah talk to uh, maybe that would be a great a great set of reframes to talk about the reframes around what's possible in your life and making your life more awesome we always say that our podcast by the way which is called brain software and i like how at the end of the book you talk about reframes being little pieces of software mm -hmm. like a reframe is a little piece of software and i think well it's a, it's like a patch that writes out the old virus and makes your life so more awesome yeah, to, to that point, um, how how much did your mind blow up when AI came on and then the rest of the world realized what you already knew, yeah. which is that that thing called intelligence was just word combinations, yeah. and that when you're a hypnotist, you see it vividly. You, know, yeah. you can yeah. tell that people are not doing thinking, it's just word combinations. But when the rest of the world figured it out, I felt like, finally, this is my time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, that's right. So, and, and then by just entirely a coincidence, the reframe book was coming out, and it was hard to explain, like, why this can change your, your brain. But once you know that intelligence, whether it's human or machine, is really just combinations of words, and then we think that's intelligence, and then we rationalize it after the fact, then I had a way to explain it. I go, oh, this is a different set of words, to replace the ones you had in your head that weren't optimized. Yeah. So all this is a software patch with words. And then yeah. people will get it right away. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the concept is powerful. When you were talking about reframing being a stage hypnotist into being a communicator, um, the same applied to me when I, I my first career, I was an engineer, which is ironically, well, not ironically, but interestingly, that's when I would be introduced to Dilbert. And I'm like, oh, this is hilarious, right? And I don't remember if this is true or not, but... I, I'd never spoken to you. I didn't know anything about you. I just knew that you were this awesome guy who did these awesome cartoons. Was it uh, a telecom company? Is that what was the, the genesis of it? Your engineering background? Yeah, I worked at first a uh, bank okay. and then mm -hmm. at, at, at the local phone company. And when I realized that the problems of the bank that I left behind, I was like, ah, oh, never have to deal with this kind of stuff again. Yeah. <laughs> and I walked into another bureaucracy. I was like, it's strangely the exactly the same with just yeah. a different jargon. The only so, thing different is the acronyms. Everything else is the same. right. That's totally. So that, that's when Dilbert yeah. was born from that. Yeah, it's exactly. And that. So I was an engineer, and I loved learning. And then I became a stock analyst, and I loved learning. And then I decided to become an entrepreneur and do hypnosis, and I loved learning. And I realized instead of being anything, I just I chunked up and go, I just love learning and teaching. And it makes my life, in my opinion, more flexible, which gives me more freedom, which is another big topic right, in the book, right. the idea of freedom and choice and flexibility. And it made so many more things seem possible. So like, as Mike said, we love the book. We thought so many of the reframes hit home. And I love that you defined the idea as a reframe is something that will help you. It doesn't even necessarily need to freaking be true. It can it be can, goofy. It can be completely false. It can, yep. be, it can be goofy or serious. And as long as you get a useful result from it, you try it on and you experiment with it. And if yeah. you like it, you keep it. And if I mean, you don't... Yeah, the test yeah. of a model is its usefulness. Yeah. You know, I mean, absolutely. I've, I used a book. I've just uh, reworked my whole exercise and eating program. Chris and I are exercise and proper eating fanatics. And um, it's helped me get my system in place mm -hmm. at age 70 now. And one of the things that I applied, having read your book, was this. I, I was born in England, so I'm a Brit. My dad was ex-British Army. And um, Royal Marine Commandos are known for being wiry, lean. They have high endurance, and they're unstoppable. And I've always liked that. And so instead of my old thing, I have to work out today, the reframe became lean, mean, like a Royal Marine. And I get up in the morning okay. and I say that and have two cups of coffee, no food. And I do my combat conditioning, Matt Fury, and I do mm -hmm. a five mile walk. And I just feel fantastic because it's suddenly become easy. And intuitively, you know, you're not going to be a Royal Marine. Right. But you don't yeah. care. Your brain, your brain responds the That's same right. way. That's the miracle of yeah. it to me, that it doesn't have to matter or make sense what you come up with. Provided, too, when you pointed out that you, it's it's resonating in your body somewhere, that like you're getting that kinesthetic response that, man, this one hits home. This one really hits home. Yeah. Yeah. 
But when uh, when I look at some of the reviews on on my book, you can tell which ones are the fake reviews. Public figures always get fake reviews. Uh, somebody's mad at you for some unrelated thing, so they'll go ahead and slide <laughs> you. But but I can always tell the fake reviews because they say uh, the book is uh, is advice I've heard before. And yeah. I'm thinking if you thought this was advice per <laughs> se, I mean I mean it overlaps in in some important ways. But that would be missing the the main theme of the book, which you could have only missed if you didn't read even the first chapter. Sounds like so, they need yeah. a reframe. <laughs> so, so the the one that has had the most impact and surprised me the most was alcohol is poison, mm. and it it perfectly illustrates your it doesn't have to make sense because is alcohol poison? Well, yes, no, maybe depends. Depends on the dose. Yeah. yeah. It has no impact on whether it works. And uh, dozens, I guess dozens, if not more than 100, people have individually said to me, you know, those those words, alcohol is poison, completely stopped me from drinking. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. uh, unless you actually talk to somebody who had that experience, it's hard to understand how much a reframe can change your whole life with one sentence. Three words in that case. Now, yeah. the, just for the viewers, it doesn't work for alcoholism. So I'm talking about somebody who just wanted to cut down to zero from too much. But uh, addiction is a whole different problem. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. Yeah. That, that's fascinating. And again, um, just the fact that you put the reframes listed again at the back of the book, it's like a smorgasbord. You can just go through and, yeah, I'll use that one. I'll use that one. Oh, I'll tweak that one a little bit. And the individuation, uh, the individuality of each one, the fact that you find the one that resonates for you. And by the time it got to the end of the book, when you're saying, you know, you made it this far and you've already you know, done this update and so on. It, it absolutely does work that way because even reading these reframes going through the book, I couldn't put it down for that reason because there is such a resonance to some of them. And the book, if you get one good solid reframe from it, it changes your life. I mean, it, it literally transforms your life. Yeah, and I really like how at chapter nine at the end, you just list them all to make it convenient. It, it's a wonderful thing because I was, I was, I probably used up my whole highlighter on this book. Uh, but then at the end, you've just got the whole list of so them. You get closer quick... to my eye with the corner <laughs> of that go, yeah. four times. It just... <laughs> oh, man. You know, that, that, that's great to hear. Um, and I I assert, and you know, there's no way to prove this, that this book is the most benefit for the least effort of any book written. Yeah. Because like and... you said, you, you skim through, you hit one that, that lights you up, and it's one sentence, and you're done. Yeah. You just read the sentence, yeah. and there's, yeah. there's nothing else that the book needs to do. You might do things differently, but that that's on you. You just it becomes Bingo. easy. Why don't you just read the sentence? The reframe becomes, I'm not lazy. I'm efficient. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. good. That's a good one. The um the other thing you made me think about was it, one of the uh, the other things I loved in the book, and I have never seen this in any book before, was when you and we sort of touched on it already. But when you began talking about systems rather than goals, oh, that yeah. to me was just like that was an aha moment beyond yeah. belief. And the whole aspect that oh I got to lose fifteen pounds, go and every day that you haven't lost that fifteen pounds, you're failing in some way. And then yeah. when you start yeah. to put a system in place, that becomes far more important and efficient as well. Yeah, the systems are better than goals is will end up being my mo biggest contribution to civilization. <laughs> you know, it won't be Dilbert. People won't. People might remember. They might not. But you, even some of the biggest business books right now, they they have to refer to systems versus goals. They usually mm -hmm. give me credit. But now it permeates everything. Yeah. <laughs> the one thing that people need to know is that a system is not just practice. Mm, practice yeah. could be a system. But but a system moves you in a, a a direction that gives you lots of options. A goal limits your options and also makes you feel a little defeated every day you're not there. But a yeah. system. So so I always use my uh, my fitness system. I've got one for uh, for eating, one for exercise. Yeah, I've got a system for everything. So my exercise system when I belong to a gym was I would uh, have days that I would drive there and I wasn't feeling it, just wasn't feeling it. And I would go there, I'd get out of my car, I'd walk into the lobby of the gym, and I would stand there and I'd look around and I would say, nope. Not today. And I would turn around and just as fast as I walked in, I'd walk out, get in my car and go home and not exercise. Now that's a victory because the system is to, is to make myself do it. 
If I just have a system that makes me do it, most of the time it's going to work. If that one time it didn't, the system still worked. So I call that a victory. Say, wow, I actually got my entire body to the gym when I desperately didn't want to. Now, here's the the hypnotist trick that is my, my favorite one for exercise. You come home from our day's work, and your body and your brain do not want to exercise. But you also know that if you did, you'd feel better like immediately and, and the next day. So one of the hypnotist trick is you say to yourself, all right, what could I do? I definitely don't feel like going for a run. There's no way I can even, can't even hold that in my mind. That would be so hard. But would it be so hard to put on some shorts? And you're like, well, I was going to change my clothes anyway. And then you say, well, suppose your footwear were your sneakers. And the footwear is like the ultimate trigger. I'm sure you, you, you've experienced this. You put on the shoes of the task which you didn't want to do, and your feet talk your brain into it almost immediately. You put on your shoes, and you're like, Ain't well, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I should at least walk around the block Yeah, because I got my shoes on. Halfway around the block, you're running, and you're off to, you're off to the races. Now, that's Literally. interesting because the application of that – and. I like walking. I, I was a runner for years. I never competitive. I did six miles four times a week and I used to love it. And then my knees gave out and I did all the gel packs and the running room and proper shoes. Nothing, nothing worked. And, um, but I've taken up walking and we're up at our cabin up North, like driving from the cabin, Northern Ontario. And so this great places to walk, you know, there's woods and there's trails and stuff. And so my wife bought me a pair of shoes for the task. Now I normally wear steel toed boots. I'm a martial artist. You know, we carry a blade, wear steel toed boots. You know, the things you're not allowed to do in the UFC is where we start. So <laughs> it's it, so I just love the walking, but she bought me a pair of European hiking boots that are just amazing. And so I started walking only with them. Now, when I put them on, as I'm lacing them up, as lacing them up, I feel the energy coming. I mean, it's absolutely anchored to it and triggering that. I, I exactly. never thought about it, but you're absolutely well, correct on that. Anybody who studied neurolinguistic programming, NLP, or hypnosis should be familiar with anchors, right? And again, yeah. not for you, Scott, because you already know this, but for all of our listeners. And I think you're right, that incrementalism, that those little baby steps, I'll oh, just put on the shorts, just put on the shoes. Suddenly, now you're in the mood and you go do it. And I really like the idea of that systems approach, because rather than focusing on the goal, focusing on that destination, rather than the process of getting there and right. the system, which is your process and the flexibility that you mentioned, you're actually giving yourself that freedom, that flexibility, and you're giving yourself the chance to build that little momentum, those baby steps. And it makes me think back to Seinfeld. I mean, when he would talk about writing comedy and how do you write good jokes, and we turned this into useful idea. Right maintain the chain remember the chain. that you yeah. write every day even if it's crap and you throw it away just write for however long it is five or ten minutes or similarly when you impl- implementing this in your workout you feel like working out do just, some just do five yeah. minutes yeah and maybe after five minutes you'll say okay i'm done i just really don't want to do and it that's today. okay and that's okay you've given yourself a win even if you just do something and go that sucked i'm done hmm. yeah the uh, the universe favors action over inaction mm-hmm. So if you don't know what to do, just do something. <laughs> yeah, I really, uh, I, was, I like your, you, when you say put on your shoes, it makes me think of Jordan Peterson, clean your room, yeah, right? Yeah. Put on your shoes can become the new, like just get, get in that state as if, use the as if frame, as if I'm going to do this and suddenly maybe I'll actually want to do it. Yeah, you know, t- taking the Jordan Peterson clean your room thing, if you don't know where to start, you know, get some control over your life doing that. But I, I take that even to a, a bigger level where I consider that my mind includes the physical objects in my environment. Yeah. So if you think your mind is just the stuff in your skull, you're going to treat it that way. But when my mind that's in my skull isn't giving me what I want, I change the environment. So I think my environment is my brain that I can reprogram. Sometimes I'm cleaning my room. Sometimes yeah. I have to go outside to get a little, you know, stand under a tree. Sometimes I got to put a food in my body, but I look at those as all my brain. It's just an extension of my mind and I can change my mind by changing my environment. Which again is a wonderful reframe. And just, just mentioning Jordan Peterson again, because I, you know, I live in Toronto, so it's, I'd heard of him through a, believe it or not, a Louisiana police officer, friend of ours. He started talking about him before I'd heard of him. And uh, when he was really taking off, I got two tickets for my wife and I, front row center, Queen Elizabeth um, Theater in Toronto, huge theater, uh, to hear him speak. 
And he did like two hours with no notes, absolutely captivating. But he does this thing that is so hypnotic. He'll pick someone in the audience near the front and he'll stand at the edge of the stage and he will speak directly to that person for maybe 90 seconds. And I was just paralyzed. Like Jordan Peterson's talking to me. I didn't hear a word he said. He's looking at me. Jordan Peterson's talking. I was like a five-year-old kid. It was absolutely fantastic. Now, are you saying that he actually talked to you specifically? Yeah, yeah oh, my oh, wife wow. and I. Yeah. So we're like, he's talking to us. Did you see that? Just amazing. I was starstruck. You know, what, do you think that was accidental or do you think he could pick? He does do it on purpose. Body? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. He picks people near the front, I guess. It's, it's probably like, just like when you're doing stage hypnosis yeah. and you see the people who are the most riveted yeah. and they get things like hypnotic rash and uh, you're getting them to volunteer. For yeah, the show. they come up on stage. Yeah. Right? I see someone in the third. Well, I don't do them anymore. But if I saw someone in the third row or fourth row and they got hypnotic rash and they're listening with riveted attention, they come up on stage and say, now, before we do the induction, I just turn to that person and sleep now. Bang. And everyone thinks I'm a freaking hero, but the person was hypnotized for 15 minutes sitting in the audience before they ever came up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I spend so much time trying to explain to people why stage hypnosis is a half magic trick. I mean, and what you just described. So if the, if the audience has this impression that you could have maybe picked almost anybody. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's that's the magic trick. If, that if is. they knew that only a few people it works they'd have a whole different impression of what, what they just watched. Absolutely. In fact, I the show I did at the theater in London, Ontario years ago, I had a professor from the local university come out to see him. He was a psychologist and he wanted to see my show. And I sort of vaguely knew him and I figured I was going to freak him out. And so partway through the show, I sent someone back to the audience who were narrowing, winnowing the group down. And this guy gets up and he has to go to cross the stage, down some steps and then down the aisle. And so, okay, you can go back, sir. And he's going back and I'm talking to the others on stage and I just turn around, he's got his back to me. And I just point at him like this without saying anything. And he can't see me and he just collapses on the floor in a trance and everyone goes nuts. And I see the psychologist going, hmm, well, it's a trick. So when they're all in trance on stage, slumped all over, as I'd walk by him, I just touch his shoulder and say, when I send you back to the audience, you'll take 10 steps and then fall into a trance again. That's it. And then later that just fires. So I'm counting in my head as he's walking back approximately. And, bang. Okay. and then I would throw it off even further and say, Mesmer was right. And he's going, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you know what? That make it okay. We we've, we've got to talk about pattern we do, interrupts we because in your book, you talked about the response that you might give to somebody on. Oh, I can't say Twitter now. I have to say X, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You'd say, thanks for your confession. All right. So do you want to explain <laughs> that a bit? And then we're gonna we're gonna draw that into some yeah. discussion on pattern interrupts, which are fun. Well, well yeah. So generally I'm just uh I'm, I'm refusing to accept their frame. Mm -hmm. So the frame is, I'm a troll, I'm your critic, I'm going to say some bad things, you're going to have to respond to me to what I said. And instead of that, I'll pick something that's not very pleasant for them, and I'll go live in it, and I'll refuse to get in their frame. So for example, I like to say, oh, I'm sorry they did this to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put them in the yeah. media. Or we have so many of these pattern interrupts like that sort of thing. I'll give you one quickly. Um, we used to do one. Well, we still do it. If someone is very annoying, we'll just turn to them and say, Jerry was so right about you. <laughs> and they say, but we've experimented. Jerry's the best name. And they invariably say, Jerry who? And we say, I think you know. What do you say? <laughs> I think you know. And the other one, I'd like, it's a, it's a higher octave. You have a cell phone. So pretend this is. Oh, yeah, sure. That I, You're talking heard. to somebody who's annoying you. It, they can be really irritating. You want to really take it to the next level. I'll take my cell phone out. My iPhone just rang or it's buzzed in my pocket. I say, just a sec. And go, Hello. And the key is to move your eyes. You're doing your trans derivational search as you're listening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'll say that was Henry Kissinger. He told me to tell you to F off. <laughs> <laughs> and using Kissinger for some reason, I think is the most powerful. <laughs> Maybe that'll I, I, be our next. Maybe that'll be our next product. We'll do another deck of cards, but like this would, this will be the pattern interrupt deck. Yeah, yeah, which we'll have to come up with a clever name for. <laughs> I, I like to tell, to tell the story about a mugging that went wrong. Somebody tried to mug me in uh, downtown San Francisco back in my twenties, and I just finished hypnosis class, and I, I just didn't feel like giving up my wallet that day. <laughs> so I'm standing in like just the worst part of the downtown San Francisco. Street person comes over. He's got he's got a knife that's about this long, and he brandishes it like, ah, you know, give me give me your wallet. So I knew that if I entered his frame as his victim, I would lose my wallet. 
and I didn't want to lose my wallet. So I didn't enter his frame. I just started talking to him like it was two people having a conversation on the sidewalk. And he was a little inebriated and he was having trouble trying to bring it back to the robbery. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> That's what, hilarious. You know? yeah. Bring and, it back to the robbery. Yeah. Can we get back to the robbery? <laughs> you know, I think he was thinking that he didn't say it, but I, I kept him going long enough, just sort of being frustrated that I wasn't getting it, that I was getting robbed. And then a muni bus pulls up and I got off, kept my wallet that day. Now, when That's you say brilliant. about the wallet, our friend Mark Andreas is an amazing hypnotist and NLP practitioner, really super guy. And he tells a story about a guy in a a strange town, strange city, didn't know. He was walking late at night, sort of got lost from his hotel, starts coming back, and two guys approach him. And the guy said, I'll have your wallet. He puts his hand out. And the response is, oh, you have my wallet? Fantastic. I'm not being, where did you find it? I've been looking for it. And they go, what? I lost it back there. Did you? And he actually gets them to start looking for it with him. Oh. Like it changes the framework hypnotically, just remarkably. And they become oh, his assistants God. now. And naturally, they can't find it. And they leave him alone and let him go. I mean, just wonderful. <laughs> Pattern interrupts are amazing. <laughs> oh, that is, that is great. <laughs> um, let, let's, okay. We could talk about this all day. It's such a fun topic. I want to talk about toxic people. You have some great oh. from ones that really resonate with us because so for years, we've always been saying sometimes you have to fire, fire your people friends. from your life yeah. or even yeah, fire your friends, friends who are no longer useful friends anymore in some way. They think they're your friend, but really they're just toxic in your life and you got to cut them out. And you had some reframes in there that were just hitting home for us as absolutely resonating with that concept. Which ones? Because I have a few that it might. Was there one in particular you can prompt me on? Well, the one about um, cutting out toxic people from your life. So instead of instead of how to deal with, I think it was one to the effect of how you deal with toxic people. You don't. You just you just cut them out of your life entirely. Yeah. Does that yeah. does that sound about right? Well, I, I, I'm sure I have something like that. But let me speak to it generally. Perfect. Um, if you believe you can fix them. That's it. Or you believe you can learn how to deal with them, you're you're just never going to succeed. So you just have to just have to understand that your life's better without them. One one of the things that oh, this might be the one you're talking about. If you talk to people who have uh, gone through a breakup or mm -hmm. quit a job, if it's been a year, ask them if they're glad that they quit the job, even if they got fired. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get fired, and a year later you'll say, "Do you wish you were still working there?" hardly ever does somebody say yes. It, yeah. Almost never. If you say, it's been a year, do you wish you were still together with the person you broke up with? Even if they were the one who didn't choose it, they're like, yeah, you know, in time I can see this wasn't going to work. So if you just take your brain to the future and you say, no matter how much this hurts, I can see myself in that future and I'm pretty happy there. So just just bear with it. And then the other reframe that uh, reminds me of this is when my uh, young stepson used to get a, like a cut or a bruise or something, and he'd be wailing. And uh, I would say, oh, let me look at that. And I'd say, That's, uh, that looks like a four-minute situation. Yeah. I remember that <laughs> right. one. Yeah, yeah. That's a, and so, I like the congruent, just saying, that's a four-minute problem. Boom. <laughs> and, and then he'd ask me to set a timer. And of course, I'm just making up the four minutes. Yeah, but yeah. you know, somewhere along the lines, he's feeling okay because you know he knows there's an end to the problem. So just yeah. knowing there's an end is sometimes good enough. I, I really like what you brought up is uh, positioning the future, like thinking about the future rather than the current situation. And that reminds me of years ago, uh, after one of our jujitsu classes, we were at the pub as we often would do. And we were hanging out with a, a lady who was at one of our oh, students' yeah, yeah. friends. And she had been complaining about her career for a long time, her job, her boss situation. She wasn't happy. And instead of focusing on the current frame, I got her to focus on the future frame. All I did is I looked right one at sentence, her. I yeah, I that. said, because this had been going on for a while and I wanted to be friendly with my way of interrupting the way she was thinking about it and offer a different frame, the future frame. And I think I said to her something along the lines of, how are you going to feel one year from today when we're sitting in this exact pub having this exact same conversation? And that's all, that's it, all took. it took. She quit her wow. job the next Monday. Yep. She's doing great now. Yeah. Yeah. Because she needed wow. something to just kick her into gear and stop thinking about the current complaint and think about, one year from now, 
I'm going to be doing the same thing. That's not cool with me. That's a waste of a year. What am I going to do instead? I'm going to go and do something else. So she didn't even have a plan. She ended up quitting her job. She ended up discovering that she loved being a server at a restaurant yep. and just interacting with people, she making great tips. money She's with tips. Yeah. yeah, I'm still in touch with her. It's interesting. Just if I interject here, uh, guys, the thing about using time, progressive in time, looking back, mm -hmm. uh, the as if frame. So years ago, I had a client when I was a therapist and she, older woman, lost her husband, her second husband, both died of heart attacks. And she was just in the dumps and had been for some time and got a piece of paper. And I said, listen, uh, it's two years from today. Just be there in your head. OK, um, you've got friends now. You've got a social life. You're physically fit. You're having fun again. Mm -hmm. How did you do it? Look back. How did you do it? She said, well, I guess I started going to the y YWCA again, started swimming. And what happened then? Well, I met some other women. We, we formed a bridge club. I started playing bridge and I'm watching her whole state is coming up now. And then I started walking again. And then one of the friends became one of my best friends and we took a, a vacation and she went on, on, on. And I wrote it down and I said, here, folded it up, handed it to her. I said, you've just designed your next two years. That was it. And that was the entire intervention. I didn't do anything. I just took notes, but that you know, used time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, the the most powerful reframe I've ever seen, except for alcohol is poison, this might be like number two, and it works so many ways in so many situations as three words, life is short. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Almost even when you're hearing those words out of context, mm -hmm. you, you, you can even just feel the whoosh. power. Yeah, yeah. That. You just yeah. made me realize or reminded me of what was in your book that I, I really loved your framing of history, the past. Yeah. It, do, it doesn't it, exist anywhere. Thinking, you think about the concept of a nominalization yeah. in hypnosis or NLP. We talk about words that you can't put in a wheelbarrow, like empowerment or interest or, or intelligence yeah, or bad stuff like depression or sadness. Well, everything in the past isn't really tangible anymore it's just something that you're thinking of it's not real and life is short let it go move on think about the future instead of the past i yeah. thought that was really really yeah, wise powerful. yeah and then the the upgrade to that because if you just say that that helps a lot but uh, sometimes i'll put it into more uh, let's say visual terms and i say imagine uh, you just spawned into your life you're a video game mm -hmm. and you just or you just came into life and you looked around and you said, okay, what resources do I have? What character am I playing? Yeah. Now I can, I, I've had some, you know, I've had some bad luck in the last year or so. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's heard, <laughs> but from, you know, everything from a, my cat died to a divorce to, you know, you, you name it. But every day I could do the same thing. I could say, all right, if I respawn today into this video game, what do I have to work with? I'm healthy. I'm rich. I have all kinds of skills that I've developed up to this point. I got this house. My dog is awesome. The weather is perfect. And I say, if I were starting from here, like if you if you never had any past and you just were born into this life yeah. that I've been bitching and wailing about, like, oh, I'm so sad about this. But if you put me in this life, I don't who would trade with it. Like, yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. And you, yeah, because you have no emotional ties to any of the crap from the past. You just got parachuted into yeah. this Scott Adams at age sixty-five. Hey, things are pretty awesome. Yeah, and, yeah. and likewise, you know, if, if somebody had the, more of a family situation, and you said, "All right, if you just were born into this family, how do you feel about it?" And they'd be like, "Well, I wouldn't trade this for anything." Yeah. So it just completely rearranges your brain just, almost. Just, totally, I totally. could totally. tell my daughters that one. <laughs> you got it pretty good, girls. Yeah, yeah. good luck with that. <laughs> you know, let's, yeah. as we're wrapping up pretty soon here, but I just want to mention to you, um, the other thing I, I loved, and honestly, I, my wife was doing laundry up at the cabin, mm -hmm. and I said, take this book. You've got to read this book. Yeah. So no, she's reading it. And it was the one about your your job is not your job. <laughs> your yeah. job is to find a better job. Well, I want you to know, Chris, <laughs> found a better job <laughs> i work with him uh but no well yeah your job is not your your actual job is to find a better job and i also like that your job is to lower your stress levels right yeah they're both really good reframes yeah it's, uh, when i was a teen i realized that i was sort of an anxious teen mm -hmm. and i thought you know i don't want to live like this for the rest of my life so i made it like a full-time mission Mm -hmm. to figure out all the ways that a person can relax. Mm -hmm. So that's when I became like a, a fitness guy, you know, yeah. lifelong and 
try to eat right, get enough sleep. I mean, you, you have to take like a little piece at a time until you've put together something that, yeah, at the moment you could plop me into the world middle of World War Three, and I'd be like feeling okay. You're pretty yeah. chill. <laughs> yeah. Get the resources like, available. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a learnable skill. You don't realize yep. how learnable it is until you get serious about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, I know you said we're going to wrap up. We'll wrap up in a minute or two. I want to give you a chance, though, also to talk a little bit about the the social stuff. You had a whole bunch of reframes around things like social anxiety and having confidence and self-esteem. And I just I would love for you to share some of that because there were some really, really great ideas for people who right. don't understand the idea of embarrassment and what that really means. Right. Let, let, let me uh, describe it, but I'm also going to be solving some of the viewers' biggest problem they have in life. Bring it just, on. Just in the next, like, two, three minutes. Let's do it. So most of us, if you're normal, you have some social anxiety about going to a new place or any gathering where you got to make a bunch of conversation. So the first thing I'm going to do for your viewers is teach them how to be the best conversationalist in the room, or at least top 10%. Right, it might be some superstars there, but you'll be in the top ten percent. And it's just the Dale Carnegie question stack. You just walk up to somebody, say, "Hi, I'm Scott." Hopefully, they introduce themselves. It would be good if you repeat their name because that's good technique, and also good if you say it again while you're talking to them. Well, you know, Bob. You know, blah blah blah. So now you're already into the top fifty percent of all capable people. Mm-hmm. So know that. If you just did, if you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, "Hi, I'm Scott," they tell you their name, and then you can use it again later. Top fifty percent, mm-hmm. you, you've already you're already above average. Now to get to the top ten percent, all you have to know is that people don't care about your stories, but they like to talk about themselves. Mm-hmm. The most basic thing you need to know about a human being. So there are some you know established, well-known questions that seem like they're a little nosy, but they won't seem like that to the person you're talking to. Yeah. So you might say, after after you know their name, you say, hey, uh, are you here for the this, or are you a friend of the bride, or whatever the situation is? They'll tell you why they're there. Now, they're very happy already, because you've given them something to say that they don't have to think about, because they can answer that question easily. Then you say, "Uh, you married? Oh, yeah, married, uh, got any kids? And then people love to talk about their kids. Where do you live? Where do they go to school? Anyway, basic questions like that. Sooner or later, you're going to get a hit where there's something they said about themselves that matches something about you. Mm -hmm. So if they say, oh, yeah, I work work at the phone company. I'd say, I used to work at the phone company. Yeah, which part of the phone company? Mm -hmm. If the kids go to school, because you're usually local, you go, where do they go to school? Foothill? My kid goes to Foothill. How do they like it? Right. So there's always that. You're only looking for that. Now that I've told you this technique and I've told you that the other person doesn't feel like they're being interrogated, they feel like it's a gift Mm -hmm. because they know what to say. Their social anxiety has been eliminated because now you're talking to them. They're not standing alone and you've, you've fixed their problem. All right. So in two minutes, I made everybody who's watching in the top 10% of capable people. Now here's the reframe. You're not walking into a room that you're going to get embarrassed. You're walking into a room where you're in the top 10% of capable people, and there's a lot of people here who need your help. So you're going to save them. You are the rescuer. You're not the victim. They might be the victim, but you're going to save them. So you see that person who's awkward in the corner? You walk right up to them. You save them. That person is dying. Yeah. Uh, 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 I'll pretend to look at my phone. Exactly. Uh, and then there are just a few other tricks. One is uh, how to leave a group, you know, gracefully. I like the, uh, well, it looks like my drink is evaporated. Uh, Can I get you a drink? Usually they'll say no, and that gives you a chance to walk away. But the one that just works all the time, if it's a group gathering, is you can just say directly, hey, it's been great to meet you, Bob. Uh, I need to do a little more mingling. Yeah. Every Mm -hmm. Every time I need to do more mingling is not personal. And it's also something they need to do. Mm-hmm. They got to get their mingle on too. So somebody has to say it first. So you just say, great to meet you. Uh, do you need a drink? Are we going to grab a drink or use the restroom, whatever? Then the last trick is how to find the group to break into. Let's say you walk in the room. Everybody's already paired up. I would stay away from a group with an alpha male who's holding court because he's not one, he's, the, the alpha male is not going to give up his power. 
it might might even turn a shoulder to you mm-hmm. to keep talking, right? Like kind of you know a hole behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Women won't do that. If you find the woman who seems like the alpha female, maybe the host, but somebody who's moving easily among the groups, if you see her, you know, uh, take or leave, intercept. <laughs> you want to intercept the strongest female dominant player because they they like to do uh, introductions. Oh, have you met so and so? Have you mm-hmm. met so and so? And they'll set you up for your next conversation. So always go for the strongest female player because they will incorporate you quite naturally. Brilliant. So that's uh, made me think that of, is advice that can solve a lot fun, of social sorry, anxiety. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you made me think. You want to tell this? Okay. I'll tell you. I'll give you a headline edition really quick. When I was in my early twenties, I'd, I'd learned a lot of card magic, and I was pretty good with it. And I found it as a, a, a an icebreaker. And I went to a party once, and it was kind of quiet. And I walked into the main in the living room, and there was a guy sitting in a corner seat next to the fireplace. And I said, Boz on the fireplace, and he's holding court. He's this great looking guy. All the women are just sitting around him, just swooning. And he's just going on and on, doesn't say hi to anyone, just telling how great he is and how much money. And they're just all this wonderful. And so as he's talking, I stop listening to his voice and start staring at his gestures as though there's something vaguely odd about them and watching his hands and moving my head. So he's picking up on this unconsciously. And as he's talking, I got up, walked over and I moved the vase on the fireplace like it was in danger of being knocked off. And he went, what are you doing? I said, oh, nothing. He said, why did you move that? I said, oh, it's okay. You're enjoying yourself. Go ahead. You're enjoying yourself. And it took the wind out of his sails. And he sort of stopped talking. I pulled a deck of cards out and bang, took over. It was fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Mike's got a lot of experience of that kind of hilarious stuff. I was not always the integrated man I am now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Look, I I want to just offer this as a wrap up. I think that stuff you just taught everybody about some basic social skills anybody and we know so many people who've come to us because they felt uncomfortable in social situations they didn't know how to make friends they didn't know how to find somebody to get romantically involved with whatever the case may be that is gold advice in fact so many of the reframes in this book and mike and i can attest to the fact this is just as an epic gold mine of ideas for everybody out there listening or watching get the book it's a life read it but buy it for your friends give it to them yeah yeah and and we want to say thank you scott for reaching out to us and and doing this podcast with us it's a lot of fun it's great to get to know you and to put a face behind the 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 cartoon strip that i used to read when i was in my 20s and still do and love and uh, to discover that you're into hypnosis and personal development I, i've and not fitness. known that for very yeah, yeah your your diet and fitness stuff lines up bang on with the venn what, diagrams like, overlap mm-hmm. to a huge degree so we are now friends there we go excellent man so, so the, the the reason you came to my attention uh, early was because I bought the Mike Mandel uh, cards. I guess oh, you I'm going to ship version. you the I'm going to ship you the new ones. New version. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so let let me do a commercial for your product. Oh, I oh love wow! You. I, I I can't tell you how many people have gotten these because I did them on my live stream. Like yeah. I'd pull out some cards and, and and read them and see what people would say, and uh, th- these are awesome. Like oh, a little little hypnosis trick on each one, conversational trick. Thank you. Yeah, the whole idea was something. In fact, I'll tell you the genesis of this. We used to recommend a deck called Zebu Cards. So the original uh, was the same idea, Ericksonian language patterns on a deck. And we'd tell everyone who came to Toronto in our class, oh, yeah, you want to practice this stuff, get Zebu Cards. They were ridiculously hard to find. They're not in print anymore. It's like we can't tell people to get these in good conscience when they're unbuyable. So one day I just thought, Let's just make our own. It's, it's got to be something that we can do. Other people have made custom decks of cards, so we made our own. We love them, and they're they're really they're really a fun, low cost item. But we didn't yeah. refer to the competing mm-hmm. decks. We reverse engineered it based on the patterns we were already using. Yeah, and the already patterns teaching, are no so secret. Copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are original exact words on there, but the principles are all the same, <laughs> and they come generally out of the fields of NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis. Sure. And thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you saw our Facebook ad and picked up a deck right and that the mailman actually delivered them to you. And Well, you know, uh, what kind of a hypnotist would you be if you couldn't sell me a deck of cards? I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now we're going to do our traditional ending, and I think you know how to do it with us. So we'll say to everybody, thanks for watching. This has been epic. And Scott, your book is available, obviously, Amazon, Kindle. I'm not sure where else. Um, maybe just give us a, a two two words on where people can connect with you and where they can buy your stuff. 
uh, Amazon for the book, and uh, you see me on the X platform at Scott Adams says. Scott Adams says. Excellent. All right. So let's let's uh, let's end in style. Yeah, we'll end it as we usually do. So here as we go. Thanks, Thanks again, again, and good, good night. night. Good night. <laughs>